Yeah. Oh, hello. Last week, I introduced you to the 10 big daily exercises that Brad Garner used to use with his students at Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music and the Juilliard School. They're great exercises. I'll link them here if you wanna look at them again or for the first time. Three of those 10 exercises deal with articulation and two of those three exercises are actually not exercises at all. They're pieces of music, but that's part of why they're so appealing to practice. One of them we mentioned last time is the Bach BWV 1033. C major sonata, second movement. The other one we're going to look at today is the flute solo, Voliere, from Saint-Saëns, Carnival of the Animals. Voliere means aviary. Once again, we are birds. <laughs> if I'm going to call this the best excerpt for double tongue practice, I figure I should list at least one runner-up as well. I personally love the fourth movement of Scheherazade by Rimsky-Korsakov. I love that whole piece. Letter U through the Pew Stretto of the fourth movement. There is insane double tonguing. So if you have worked on this sound song piece a lot and you need something new, I'd say dig up that Rimsky-Korsakov. And if you have your own favorite excerpt that has really hard double tonguing to work through, why don't you put it in the comments? I'm sure other people would like to see practice ideas for double tonguing. Back to the sans son. If you're going to use this as a double tonguing exercise, I think it's extremely important to practice it right. Practice it as you would to prepare it for an orchestral audition because it's a very important orchestral excerpt. You don't want to practice kind of casually just for double tonguing, not think about anything else, and then find yourself in a situation where you've got a lot of ingrained not so good habits. Here are some of the most important things to keep in mind while you're practicing this excerpt. First of all, don't double tongue on autopilot. Do think about exactly how you're double tonguing. In this case, I would really say dugga 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 versus tucka 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 for a few reasons. One is that the less of your tongue you use, the faster you can double tongue, and this is going to go fast. If you do tucka, that uses more of your tongue, dugga uses less. You're imitating a cute little bird, or perhaps a lot of cute little birds in the aviary. So we want it to sound easy and light and legato, and if you use a light legato, dugga, 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 that will accomplish those things. If you're confused about why it would make any difference to think dugga, dugga, dugga versus tucka, 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 go back and watch my best double tonguing exercise video. I talk about dugga versus tucka in there. Your tongue can make a huge difference with how light it sounds. So can your fingers. I use some trill fingerings here to keep things lighter because if you use all real fingerings, even if you go fast, it can sound pretty heavy. The high D to E the high E to F, the C to D that's above the staff. And when I use trill fingerings other places as well as here, I like to start the trill with real fingering and then switch to the trill fingering. So I do the first three notes here with the real fingering and then I switch to the trill fingering because the trill fingering, the tone isn't as good, the pitch isn't as good, it's better for the audience to first hear that real fingering and then they might not notice the trill fingerings as much. There's one place I could easily choose to use a trill fingering, but I don't. That's the first line of the second page, the C to D within the staff. I don't use my trill key for the D. I feel like that D is too hollow and ugly. So I use the real C to D fingering. However, I don't fuss around with my pinky. I play the D, I leave my right hand second and third finger on for the C, and then I don't bother moving my pinky around. I talk about doing this kind of thing in a video called Advanced Flute Balance, I talk about using your fingers to help enhance your flute stability. Instead of doing this, you just do this. Another thing that I do to keep this excerpt sounding very light and like a little cute bird is that I plan very carefully what I want to do with the dynamics. Mostly this boils down to making phrases end in a light, tapered way rather than a heavy way. We have all these phrases that drift up and we could either pound them out as we go up or we can taper them gently so that they sound like a little bird just flying off into the distance. It gets lighter and softer and it stays cute. The main way that I do this is that I think of a bit of a crescendo 
going down to the bottom notes in the first few phrases, and then out of that light crescendo, it's easy to do a decrescendo so that as I go up, I can decrescendo. This is the same idea that we see at the end of this excerpt. The last run, we have a lovely little diminuendo to a pianissimo high F. I'm doing a very similar thing where I'm crescendoing down to the bottom and then making a diminuendo back up to the top. If you let yourself do what your flute wants and crescendo as you go up the phrases, it can give you the sound of a big, fierce attacking bird. Another important element to practicing this is you have to remember there are several typos in it. Unfortunately, that's just the way it was published. At number two, there is a bad typo. You should have a 16th rest followed by five eighth notes followed by a 16th note. So all these A's are syncopations. The way the typo came out, it's like they're on the beat and the beats don't work out in the measure. That's the most important typo to catch. The next one is that in the fourth bar of two, you may never even notice this, but if you look closely at the chromatic scale in that measure, it's supposed to be a chromatic scale. There is a B flat missing the way that it's written here, but that B flat at the end of the measure should be there. By the way, while we're looking at these measures, let's note that it's very clever what Sanson has done with these measures here. He's written in an accelerando. We start with groups of four notes, and then the last beat of both the fourth and sixth measure of two, we've got five notes, where we used to have four. Well done, Sanson, that was very clever. Also, while we're looking at these measures right after number two, let's not neglect to mention what I think is the Mozart moment. I believe that Sanson very intentionally is paying a little tribute to Mozart G major concerto right here. typos, the little slur right after number three should not be there. It's not in the score, and if you look two measures later where you have the same entrance, there is no slur there. One more slur issue, if you look at the antepenultimate measure, the antepenultimate measure, the third measure from the end. In the score, there's a slur over the dots in that measure. You do articulate, you do have some separation, but it gives you this nice legato feel which really helps you do the crescendo down to your low F before you have that nice little taper up to your high F, like a cute little bird flying away. One more thing I'll say about practicing this excerpt. I did a video a while ago on fast double tongue, fast fingers, and I suggested in that video that you separate out what your fingers are doing and what your tongue is doing. I'll link to that video so that you can learn more about how I suggest that you do that. But here I would just double tongue on each and every note if you're trying to get your tongue to go faster or slur if you wanna get your fingers going really fast. I've made a big point today that even though I've introduced this to you as a really good double tonguing exercise, you want to keep practicing it like an excerpt. Let me tell you a personal story, if you have a little patience for that, that will explain to you why I think it matters. When I was auditioning for doctoral programs, I went to New York. The Juilliard audition and the Manhattan School of Music audition were days apart from each other. They do that on purpose so you can easily come and audition at both places. I went and auditioned at Juilliard. This is before they had callbacks, so there were over 100 flute players there auditioning for four spots, and everyone had a 10-minute audition. I went in and I played my 10 minutes. I felt like it went well, but at the end of the 10 minutes, they just said, okay, thank you very much. And I had this literal, physical, sinking feeling of, well, at least I tried. So I thought my audition for Manhattan School of Music a few days later was very important because I wanted to move to New York. I went and I auditioned at Manhattan School of Music. I had a 15 minute audition, but they had me in there for a half hour. They were talking to me a lot. They heard a lot of the solos that I brought. And right towards the end of the half hour that I thought would be 15 minutes, they said to each other, should we have her play anything else? Should we hear one more thing? They conferred and they said, oh, let's hear her play the Sanson, Carnival of the Animals. 
And I had not been working on it that much because it was not required at Juilliard or any other schools. So I pulled it out and I thought my future, whether I can move to New York or not, probably depends on this excerpt. <laughs> because in my mind, I'd already written off Juilliard and this was the end of an audition that so far seemed to be going really well. And I thought if I fall on my face now, I could ruin this. So I pulled it out, I looked at it, I remember zeroing in focusing, concentrating harder than I ever had before in my life. And I did nail it, thankfully. <laughs> but I had been concentrating so hard that I knew when I finished playing, my face was turning bright red. I could feel myself flushing from the effort of concentrating so hard on that excerpt. I was so glad that I had practiced this not only as a double tonguing exercise, but I tried to play it really well and musically so that I was able to bring that back up to the surface somehow when I was under pressure. The good news is I did get into Juilliard and Manhattan School of Music and the final little coda to this story, I guess I'll tell you. There was a little committee of people at both schools that would interview doctoral candidates before admitting you to the program. At Manhattan School of Music, there was one person on that committee who was pretty snooty with me. Years later, I met him at a concert venue far away from New York and someone introduced me to him and I said, oh, I remember you. I came and auditioned to be in the doctoral program at Manhattan School of Music and you were on the committee. And he said, oh, well, I'm very sorry we did not admit you. I'm sure that you're still a wonderful musician. I said to him, oh, actually, I was admitted to Manhattan School of Music. Thank you very much. But as it turned out, Juilliard gave me a bigger scholarship. And so I did think hard about it, but I ended up going to Juilliard. <laughs> Sometimes life does work out and you do get to say exactly the right thing at exactly the right time. <laughs>